Hi there, I am Jonathan Rowson, and I would like to review the recent Netflix docudrama called The Social Dilemma. And there's a lot to say about it. It's really important. It's, uh, it's something well worth watching. Um, I'll speak a little later about some maybe aesthetic or um, editorial kind of reservations I may have. But in terms of its premise and its purpose and its timeliness, it's an absolutely essential docudrama. It's really worth watching. So the main point of sharing this on now is to get everyone thinking and talking about the content of that um, production. And it is a production. With, it looks like I looked at the list uh, and it seems that uh, with the executive producers and the co-producers and the assistant producers and all of that, there seem to be about 15 or so producers. Um, and the director is Jeff Orlowski, and um, it's well done. You know, it's a good watch. I enjoyed it. Um, but to be honest, in some ways, the quality of the docudrama, the experience of it, matters less to me at the moment than trying to convey why it matters, because everyone and their auntie may have an opinion about the viewing experience. But I think my role is to speak a little more about the underlying ideas and why I think they're critical to understand. So a little bit of context then about me. By background, I'm a chess grandmaster mostly and academically trained principally in philosophy. And um, I spent a lot of year working in public policy. So I've, um, I have sort of woke up politically when I realized that you couldn't deal with climate change from a behavioral perspective. And I got interested in looking at climate change as what I call a seven dimensional challenge, trying to look at all of the different aspects of it. And the reason I mentioned that is that this problem that the social dilemma is trying to highlight. It's not something you can get with single pointed thinking. It is very much about drawing attention to a set of relationships in the world. Some of them are economic, some of them are political, some of them are mental health, some of them are about particular technologies, some of them are about data, about algorithms. And it's this confluence of influences that one has to get your head around. And that's what the doc docudrama does rather well. It sort of, it manages to show you these different angles and it selects the testimony from the different experts well enough. And it gives you enough lived experience and enough kind of magical realism to show, for example, how artificial intelligence takes human form. That actually, you, by the end of it, you do have some felt sense of what this problem is. But I'm going to go into it in a little bit more depth. So some years ago, I was lucky enough to chair a few events at the RSA. I used to work at the Royal Society of Arts in London. And I chaired, first of all, the Black Box Society by Frank Pasquale, whom I knew as a student uh, at Oxford. And that was my first waking up to, he called it the Black Box Society because so much was happening that we didn't really understand. So much was happening algorithmically with forms of intelligence that were basically about crunching data and making decisions that were often highly opaque. So that was the first sort of element of this, the kind of the, the hidden world of data and the crunching of data and what that means for the lived experience of people in the world. And then a bit later, a few years later, I chaired another event, and that was with um, James Williams. And this is actually a wonderful book called Stand Out of Our Light. And it's um, based on, an, it's, it's an extension of an essay that he wrote. There was a prize-winning essay called for the Nine Dots Prize. And it was an essay really drawing attention to this war on human attention. The fact that much of the social media landscape is distraction by design and polarizing by design. And so the reason this material matters so much is that actually it's a war on culture, really. It's, there's a kind of, there's a usurping of what we think of as culture. I don't know what you imagine when you think of culture. You might think of going to the theater, you might think of what's on TV. But with roughly 2 billion Facebook users and roughly 1.5 million YouTube users, and all of the other platforms, Instagram, Twitter, and whatever else, um, you have the predominant influence on in people's psyches and how they relate to each other is now coming through the internet, sometimes through computers or iPads or whatever, but often through you know mobile phone devices, just people carrying something in their pocket that gives them access to all of that. Now, I think the reason it's called the social dilemma, and to be honest, I'm not sure. I think they could have made it clearer what the dilemma is because they do say that the, de the devices that connect you also control you. 
And that might be some kind of dilemma, like either you're connected, but you're controlled, or you're not connected, but you're not controlled. I can see how that looks like a kind of dilemma, but to be honest, they don't really play with that in the in the docudrama. They don't really extend that idea that most people are actually given a choice of how they behave. On the contrary, it very much feels like we have no choice, that we're completely submerged in these technologies and, and really the social pressure to be part of them. Uh, often necessary devices for your work or your social life or your even keeping contact with family. Speaking personally, I briefly gave up having a smartphone for a while. But the most difficult thing to do was to arrange uh, multiple person conversations to manage childcare. And it was, it, although it wasn't impossible and it has been done without these phones, it was just so much easier to do it on a device like WhatsApp, for example, that we ended up reverting back to that. And I just say that as an example um, to show how these devices hook you in. And you might think, well, so what? They make life very convenient. You can get a car at your door. It can take you anywhere very quickly through, for example, Uber. You can give a message to many thousands of people, as I sometimes do on Twitter. And it's extraordinary what comes back. You know, you learn a lot in the process. Facebook can keep people in touch uh, who have lost, lost touch otherwise. So what's great about the docudrama is that they're not... It's not a hatchet job on the tech world. It's not saying all social media accounts are bad and must be destroyed at once. Although interestingly, Jaron Lanier is in there. And those of you who know his work, he's written many famous books, starting from, I think, You're Not a Gadget to Who Owns the Future? And then most polemically, I forget how many reasons, but several reasons for deleting your social media account right now. And he has a very pristine, lucid understanding of the fact that the social media world and the tech world, they are in effect uh, manipulating you on a regular basis. And that it's very hard now to access any form of culture between people that doesn't have some kind of intermediary that has a commercial interest. So one of the ways of thinking of the premise of this docudrama, The Social Dilemma, it's as if they're calling attention to the fact that between the human relationships that are mediated by, by these devices, and by these platforms. There's almost always some kind of hidden mercenary, right? Now that mercenary is not the kind of mercenary you'd expect to see with, you know, in an army who goes in to kill for nothing, for money. But there is a sense in which, because the drive is to maximize profit, and the only way they can maximize profit is through a certain kind of business model, it is the case that there is something very deceptive about the underlying phenomenon in which it feels like you're really making uh, natural relationships with people, that you're drawn to material that interests you, that you're getting what you want. But actually, this is thoroughly orchestrated. Now, the docudrama tries to show how that happens. There's a limit to how much they can do that. They're trying to reach a large audience, of course. So I understand there's a limit to that. Um, but if you did want to dig in more deeply to how it's done, I can give you Exhibit C here, which is a wonderful book called The Age of Surveillance Capitalism by Shoshana Zupov. And she's in the docudrama as well. Now, this book is, um, I forget exactly how long, but it's huge, 600 plus, including no notes, pay, uh, length book. Uh, and it's brilliant. It's very scholarly. It's very well referenced. Um, and it really goes to town on what exactly is this business model. She speaks about behavioral surplus as a concept. She speaks about the investment on behavioral, I think it's called the, the behavioral return investment cycle. And what this is all getting at is that you and I use these platforms all the time and we make decisions on them about what to follow, what to like, what to look at, how long we look at it, what we share, what we say about it. It's all recorded. Now, in the film, they give the impression that maybe they could have done this more carefully. They give the impression that this is all recorded by human-like or humans. They speak about armies of engineers. But what, that's slightly misleading because actually, although there are real people building these platforms and tweaking them and dialing them up and down um, and redesigning them and so forth, it's also true that the work is really done algorithmically. It's done by artificial intelligence. And the reason that matters, and this was a really a highlight for me of the docudrama, is that we often think of AI conquering the earth in terms of an image like maybe, I don't know, from Terminator or something. And when we think of AI, we think of, you know, Arnie saying, I'll be back or something uh, like that. A sort of very anthropomorphized version of AI. 
And we think it's far off in the future. But actually, the premise of this docudrama is that AI is already endemic and is already, in a sense, winning the culture war. It's already, it's no longer, it hasn't yet conquered human strengths, but it has conquered human weaknesses. And that's how they, they frame it in the documentary. Basically, they are targeting your weak, the weakest aspects of yourself. They're targeting a range of your cognitive biases. And anyone who's studied cognitive science or social psychology or behavioral economics or any aspect of neuroscience that covers this, what they sometimes call persuasive technology. And actually, Tristan and a few others mentioned that Silicon Valley is full of people who went to this course at Stanford about persuasive technology. And it sounds lovely, right? Persuasive technology. Maybe you could persuade people to, you know, deal with climate change or, you know, vote in the right way or whatever. But actually, it's it's really a mechanism for manip mass manipulation. And that sounds like, you know, paranoid and, you know, surely it's not that bad and I'm just chatting to my mates. And, and at an individual level, that might be true. But if you shift the dial on every individual so they do one thing rather than another because of your algorithmic design and you multiply that by several billion, then you're changing the world and not always in a good way. So the question is, how is the world being changed? And I think there, the, the docudrama is really very good. It, it makes the case that, look, first of all, it's a big hit on mental health because, first of all, your attention is constantly distracted. You get very, you know, you're getting less and less flow. The more your phone is demanding you through notifications and updates to pay attention to it, the less you're getting the states of mind that are actually good for well-being. And it's also a bit of a hit politically because uh, what drives your attention, and the lovely line here is affirmation, not information. I think that was something that Tristan Harris mentioned when he gave testimony to Congress. Affirmation, not information. In other words, what grabs your attention, holds it, and makes you want to share it is something that says, here's something I think already. It validates you. It gives you a sense of, yes, this is how things must be. And often the way you do that is through the, the in-group and the out-group. Like, these people like me are seeing the seeing clearly and yes to that. And the reason it's yes to that is because it's no to those other guys who are not seeing clearly at all and who almost by, you know, you define yourself by, by the other. So these platforms are driving political polarization. They're undermining mental health. Now, the question is, is there anything else going on? Well, yes. I mean, there's... There's a, there's a business model here, right? Now, here's where it gets very interesting for me because Tristan, who drives the narrative, and all of the other people interviewed are quite keen to say, look, we're not saying there are lots of bad guys out there in Silicon Valley. We're not saying, you know, go and arrest or, or put on trial the leaders of the major tech companies. What they are saying is they can't help it. They didn't mean it to be this way. They thought they were doing good things for the world. Um, but there's this business model. Now, I wonder about that, right? I wonder if they're being just very pragmatic in the way they're presenting this. Because it's not as though these people didn't know. I mean, there are other ways in which the docudrama hints at that. Um, for instance, the, the co-founder of uh, Facebook is also quoted as saying that we knew consciously we were doing this, that actually we were very aware we were targeting the weakest aspects of humans to get, get them to drive growth in our platform which would ultimately lead to more revenue. So there is a sense in which this is culpability in a similar way that Exxon knowing about fossil fuels driving uh, emissions causing climate change was also culpable long before they admitted it and often actively sought to prevent people knowing it. Now you might think they're very different worlds, right? You might think tech and social media and climate change, why are they even in the same conversation? And I think the great benefit of this docudrama is that it, it makes it very clear why it's part of the same phenomenon. And actually, if we're going to have any chance of dealing with major civilization-wide collective action problems, principle among them ecological, we cannot do it with a culture that is so thoroughly sliced and diced that everyone's living their own version of the Truman Show, another reference from the docudrama such that we all have our own realities, our own filter bubbles, our own epistemic communities, our own sense of what's real and what's true. As long as we have that, the chance of collaborating so that we can actually overcome genuine political differences and actually have a sort of rational debate about the way forward are vanishingly small, you know? And so the war on nature is simultaneous with the war on culture. That's why it can often feel like we're so screwed. 
And that's what the docudrama does very well. It doesn't actually go into great depth about, you know, climate or any other major issue. But it does make clear that if our culture is so compromised by forms of technology that are driven by the extraction of your attention in the service of advertisers, in the pursuit of profit for tech companies, then we have a real problem. But this is where I think it might be somewhat dishonest to say the problem is the business model. Because what is the business model really? Well, it's trying to maximize profit within the rule of law, right? And what is that? Well, that's capitalism or you know democratic capitalism. And it's, it's the pervasive norm. It's maybe somewhat questionable now with lots of authoritarian rule around the world, more and more protectionism, more and more economic nationalism. But still, the heart of this is still somehow uh, they're, do, they're being good capitalists, right? They are, you could say within the rule of law, you could also say how much are they spending on lobbying? How much are they, how much are they doing to actively get in the way of regulation that would, for example, lead to a, a tax on data extraction such that you can't store and hoard data without paying for it because you're paying for someone else's property in effect. It's just that they sign it away in some disclaimer at the bottom of a, of a, a link that you have to click on so you can get to the next thing. And everyone knows no one reads that. And that's that's not that shouldn't be the behavioral responsibility of the person who wants to go about their business online. It should be designed in a way that we don't willingly get we don't un, unwittingly give away what's of value to us. And which the value that is then given to others without us really knowing what we've given away. So this is really serious stuff. Um, it's not just about tech. The thing to understand is that the boundary between technology and culture is no longer what it used to be. You know, I wouldn't want to say they're the same thing. They're not quite, but they're thoroughly intertwined. And I think in the in the docudrama, Tristan gives a very good point where he says that we think of technology as tool-like, but tools are kind of there waiting for you to use on your own terms. This is very different. These are tools that are actually coming into your life, manipulating you, shaping your preferences, um, pushing you towards one thing that may not be what you want. Um, and this comes back to some language I've learned elsewhere from, for example, James Williams' work. He makes quite a lot of the philosopher Frankfurt's line that the problem is that social media platforms will often give you what you want, right? Apparently, they will give you what you seem to desire. Oh, click, I want that, click. But actually, that's not really what you want half the time. That's just stimulus response. That's just something about, is that something that looks like it's exciting? Is that you know, they're keeping you on there with their own technologies, their own persuasive devices. What I want to want is meaningful content that allows me to live a fuller life and have better relationships and so forth. But I'm not really allowed to access that. So I want to want something. I want to want higher order desires. But I'm not allowed to do that in my day-to-day -day experience on my phone when I'm, I'm having to scroll away to get somewhere and scrolling away and given some intermittent rewards through a carefully designed algorithm so I never quite know when I'm getting my reward but I I know I'll get it at some point so I keep checking this is you know the way they put it is that it's a race to the bottom of the brainstem now you know I studied the impact of, of neuroscience on education when I was at Harvard and I you know I, I slightly reject the idea that it's really a race to the bottom of the brainstem it's not literally the case uh, it's it's it risk sounding like neural babble but as a, a rhetorical mechanism to explain what's going on, it's not bad. And um, they claim that the key is somehow we have to have a race to the top so that we're using technology not to manipulate people, make them burnt out and desiccated and polarized and create a lonely and craving further hits online and keeping them on the screen, which is arguably what's happening now. We don't want that. Instead, we want something much more like um, people using these technologies to live the lives they really want to live and to help each other live the lives they really want to live. Now, the question is, can we get there, right? And the answer is, I think, that it's not quite the right way to frame the question. The question is, can we get there under capitalism, right? Now, I'm no raging anti-capitalist. I'm not out on the streets, you know, saying that there must be another political system and we need to bring in some kind of common as super straight tomorrow at all. But there is something uncanny about where this conversation stops and where it can't go. They say the problem is the business model, right? 
But the business model is entirely consistent with the main premises of capitalism, namely the priority legally is fiduciary duty to shareholders. And you must do what you can to maximize that share, right? Now, regulation can change that to some extent. You can even fundamentally change fiduciary duty. There are things one can do within a capitalist framework. But still, if attention is seen as a legitimate resource to be monetized, that's our lives, that's our interiority, that's all that we hold dear about what it is to be human. If that's legitimate fair game for extraction and selling, then I think we're in trouble. And if it's not... What are we really saying then about the limits and the boundaries of capitalism? You know, what is and isn't allowed to be used for profit? So there's two things there. One is like, can you even solve this problem within a capitalist frame at all? Are there tempered versions of capitalism that are so tempered that actually you can generate forms of technology with the venture capital behind them, with the incentive structure built into them, such that people still want to go forward and build a better world and make profit? Now, I say that because that extra bit and make profit is what the venture capitalists want to hear. They need to know that getting behind this good thing, and if it is a good thing, it will lead to, you know, people will get behind it ideally and we'll all build a better world together, maybe. But forgive me if I wasn't fully convinced in the docudrama. They didn't really get to that point. It was as if there were things they couldn't quite say. They, first of all, wanted to raise awareness and wanted to get people's attention on you know, this is this far and no further. Um, but I was a little interested to know how they would push that point. What do they really mean when they say redesigning technology ethically and, and presumably with a scalable model? It may not be a business model. It might be a governmental model. There might be something about these platforms have to be brought into the public sector, but that, that's big state on, st on stilts as well, which not everyone will like. Um, so maybe the last thing to say is that I don't really think it's an ethical issue. I think it's actually a deeply meta-ethical issue and it has a, a meta-psychology to it. In other words, the, the issue is not a surface level phenomenon. It's all about the underlying um, sort of spiritual vector for this conversation, if you like. It's like, what does a good human life look like? What, what follows for how you design the social world? what follows for the economic systems that serve that world and the political forms of governance that allow it to function and make decisions, how does that work on the scale of 8 billion people plus? And how does it work in a context where the world's already kind of on fire, quite literally, sadly, sometimes? And also where we no longer really have an un uncontaminated culture. We no longer have a sort of shared public realm that well, we do, but we don't access it very much. We're struggling to access that shared space of common endeavor from different perspectives. So in that context, what, what does one do? And the reason I say meta-ethical is because I think tacitly when people are talking about design of technology and the ethics of that, very often they reach for a utilitarian frame, a frame of consequences, a frame of design things in such a way that you optimize or maximize um, well-being at scale and give people what they want or maybe give them what they want to want or in Frankfurt's language help them want what they want to want and that's another conversation but it's worth pursuing that and checking it online if you haven't already we want people to actually feel that they're shaping their own lives on their own terms in a way that's aligned with the greater our, our human understanding over many millennia of what a good life looks like not randomly satisfying desires that come to you through advertising Right? We, want, we, have, we have some idea of what a good life looks like. It's not a blank slate. And the question is, how can you bake that into your model? So rather than just having a utilitarian model or a simple deontological model or a Kantian model, which is about right and wrong and moral law, we need to start talking about you know, virtues and, and virtue development and the, the virtuous virtual, if you like. And in fact, we have to get to the virtuous virtual somehow but that means designing persuasive technologies to persuade you to grow in the right way morally spiritually socially cognitively epistemically and so forth so that actually it's not just about an, a negative freedom view of giving people what they want and not constraining them it's actually a tacitly a positive freedom view it's a freedom 
uh, to grow in a certain way towards the good life. Um, and that, but that's a meta-ethical inquiry. It's not something that you can very easily get in to any given algorithm known at the present. Rendering virtue ethics into algorithm might be, dare I say, impossible, probably not impossible, but certainly very, very exacting because it's not something that lends itself to the language of optimization and coding in the same way that a utilitarian logic or a deontological logic does. And at Perspectiva, the organization I run, we're about to begin a project called the Digital Ego. Uh, and that's being run by Tom Chatfield, the tech philosopher, and Dan Nixon, formerly of the Bank of England, and now a, an independent writer and a mindfulness advocate. And together, they're trying to make sense of uh, why the ego, rather than the mind, is the best lens through which to look at how you design a sort of meta-ethics for the digital space. And uh, I'm helping them with that and excited by it. And I thought of it a lot while watching this docudrama. But the main thing to say after all of that, um, well, two last points, if you don't mind. One is, I'm still not totally sure what the social dilemma is. It would have been nice to hear that a bit more clearly. The other is that I'm not totally sure. Um, I think they modeled it on An Inconvenient Truth by Al Gore. And they have this premise that first raised cultural awareness and from that cultural awareness, a million flowers will somehow bloom. But I think that's highly questionable. You know, so much, so, you know, emissions did not stop with, with Al Gore's documentary, despite people's greater awareness. And sometimes awareness can actually be a sort of false achievement because it can make you think that something is happening. But meanwhile, unconsciously, we're still being manipulated every day. And the same algorithmic functions and the same business logic is happening. So that was my broader response to this issue. It's really very important to rein for anyone under, wanting, to, wanting to understand how you make impact on wicked problems at scale, civilization-wide problems at scale. You must understand the nature of the behavioral manipulation, the algorithmic logic, um, the techniques used to effectively extract human experience, render it into data, use that data for predictive modeling, sell that predictive modeling to advertisers. Those advertisers in turn manipulating you, giving you things that you apparently want, but may not actually want. And so it goes on, this consumerist repetition. Uh, meanwhile, the rich get richer, the poor tend to get poorer, and things are not improving. And likewise, if you wanna have collective action on an issue like climate change, you need people to have access to the same world, you know, the access to the same truth and be able to say something uh, where they can feel that others will see the world roughly as they do. There will be some goodwill disagreement, hopefully. But nonetheless, uh, unless you have something like that, we're really in very, very deep trouble. So I think Tristan Harris and the others in this docudrama are absolutely right that this is a preeminent issue to get on top of. It's in some ways even deeper in its importance than climate change, I think. You might think without climate change, we have no planet. But without dealing with the technological manipulation of culture, our chances of dealing with a problem like climate change are extremely small. So it's an urgent issue, and I'm very grateful to the people for making this documentary, to Orlowski and all the producers, and to Tristan Harris for the great work he does, and the others that were also on the docudrama. Um, and I hope you've enjoyed this review. I'm sorry it's gone on for almost half an hour, but uh, I just wanted to share it uh, because it's very, very important, and I hope you watch and enjoy the documentary and get talking about it, but don't stop there. Think deeply about what this means because it's not at all easy to deal with it, but we have to find a way somehow. It might be regulation, it might be deeper than that, but it starts by first of all waking up to the fact that it's a real and present danger to all of us because it stops us from acting collectively in the way that we have to at this critical juncture in history for lots of reasons. Thank you very much and take care. Bye.